opposition after the grant of the patent. We had just seen how opposition operates before the grant of a patent, what we commonly call pre-grant opposition. And we had also mentioned the grounds of pre-grant opposition are the same when it comes to post-grant opposition or opposition after the grant of a patent. But the only difference is that these grounds will now be applied to a granted patent. In pre-grant opposition, the same grounds were applied to a patent that was in the application form, that is the patent application. A grant had not materialized, which means the patentee did not have the rights of a patentee. He did not have any rights that were conferred by the patent, but it was still in the application state. Once it moved from the stage of application, now there is a grant. So there are certain conditions that will change. The grounds remain the same, but the point of intervention of the ground is post grant. It happens after the grant. But the rights of the parties are now different. In pre-grant opposition, the opponent was questioning something that would materialize into a right. It had not had materialized into a right. The application is still in the process of prosecution and the opponent has raises various grounds for challenging it. And because the oppo opponent is seen as a person who aids the examination, those are the words of the Delhi High Court, the, uh, op the opponent is a person who aids the examination, the question of burden of proof could be different when we are post-grant opposition because an opponent in a pre-grant opposition does not have a party status. He is not a formal party and the proceedings are not regarded as proceedings between two parties. A pre-grant opposition is not regarded as a proceeding between the opponent and the applicant. It is not. So, we understand the status of an opponent as being different in pre-grant and post-grant. And because the status of an opponent is different, the burden of proof by which we mean the burden to discharge or prove the case is also different. Now, we will understand these things as, as we look at the procedure of post-grant in greater detail, but the grounds tend to be the same. Now, let us look at the provision. 25.2 deals with post-grant opposition. Now, 25.2 tells us at any time after the grant of a patent, so the time for filing a post-grant opposition is the prerequisite is the patent should have been granted. Now, how does the post-grant opponent come to know about the patent grant? Obviously, the grants are published in the official journal. So, what is published in the official journal as a granted patent, which means the patent will now have a patent number. Earlier, in pre-grant opposition, there is no patent number. There is only an application number by which the application is known. So, in this case, it has already been published and the publication of the grant happens in the official journal that is kept by the patent office. The official journal is an online journal now. It is the online version is published every Friday. At any time after the grant of the patent, but before the expiry of a period of one year from the date of publication of the grant of patent. So, just how we saw a window period for pre-grant opposition, there is a window period for post-grant opposition also. In the post-grant opposition, the window period starts from the grant of the patent and the grant of the patent has multiple meanings. It could be as granted at the patent office. It could be uh, the certificate that is issued to the patentee that could also, it is also a part of the grant. It could be the publication of the grant in the official journal. So, here what is being referred to as grant of a patent is the publication of the grant in the official journal. So, if you look at the official journal, the online copies are available. You will find at one section of the official journal, all the grants are published. All the patents that were granted in that week will be published with their patent number, whatever the number is. So, the grants are known by the publication. The publication in the official journal is a means by which the grant or the fact that a patent is granted is communicated. So, that is the time by which we determine the window period for filing a post-grant opposition. So, from the date of grant as published in the official journal till a one year period before the expiry of a one year period from the date of publication of grant again in the official journal, 
a patent can be a opposition to a granted patent can be filed what we call a post grant opposition so post grant opposition the timeline opens from the date of grant and the from the as i said date of grant means many things but from the date the grant is communicated to the world at large to third parties which is publication in the official journal what we call the date of publication of grant that's the word used here you have a one year time period for filing a post grant opposition so the window period starts from the date of publication of grant it extends up to one year and the publication of grant is known by the publication in the official journal though the provision of the act is silent we understand that from the practice the section continues any person interested may give notice of opposition to the controller in the prescribed manner on any of the following grounds namely you need not worry the grounds because the grounds are the same we'll just quickly go through the grounds are the same as we discussed in pre grant opposition only thing now they are going to be applied after the grant so the the point at of intervention the point at which these grounds are going to be applied are now going to be after the grant now the status of a person who can file a post grant opposition is a person interested and the person interested is defined under the act the definition of a person interested is already there uh, in section 2 is defined in section 2 may give notice of opposition now notice of opposition is given in form 7 you can see the cross reference there f7 uh, to the controller in the prescribed manner on the following grounds so we find that there is a procedure there is a notice that has to be issued and when you look at the fees there is also a fee that the opponent has to pay so there is a fee for filing post grant opposition the status of a person is slightly different because uh, you will find that in pre grant opposition we saw that any person could file a pre grant opposition whereas here it is any interested person now what are the grounds the first ground a Th- that the patentee or other person under th- or through whom he claims wrongfully obtained the invention we saw the same ground for pre grant opposition as as well b that the invention as claimed in any claim of a complete specification has been published before the priority date this is anticipation by prior claim okay in a specification or any other document so anticipation by prior uh, prior publication published before the priority date c is anticipation by a pending application we saw a similar ground in pre grant opposition as well four that is d is anticipation by prior knowledge or prior use publicly known or publicly used then e is lack of inventive step fact that what was claimed was obvious to a person skilled in the art or did not involve an inventive step it just mentions obvious here but we understand that obviousness is a standard that is determined from the viewpoint of a person skilled in the art f the subject matter of any claim is not an invention within the meaning of this act or is not patentable under the act section 3 section 4 g that the complete specification does not sufficiently and clearly describe the invention or the method by which it is to be performed the requirements under section 10 so if the requirements under section 10 are not satisfied it could be a ground for post grant opposition as well h the patentee failed to disclose information under section 8 that is filing of form 3 or he has furnished information which is in any material particular was false to his knowledge again we mentioned this as a ground that is tied to the conduct of a patentee in pre grant it is tied to the conduct of an applicant in this case it's tied to the conduct of a patentee in case of a patent a patent granted on convention application the application was not made within 12 months of the first application or the basic application this is preserving the timeline in filing international application so if a basic application was preferred abroad and it is followed up by a convention application and it enters india through a convention application 
the timeline of 12 months was not honored the patentee filed beyond 12 months now this becomes a ground of opposition only in post grant means that the patent has already been granted the patent office has overlooked the fact that the convention application timeline was not kept but still it is open for the post grant opponent to raise this as a ground so that if the patent office had by oversight granted the patent it could be a ground for revocation j the patent specification does not disclose or wrongly mentions the source and geographical origin of the biological material k what was claimed was anticipated having regard to knowledge oral or otherwise available with any local or indigenous community in india or elsewhere what could generally be called anticipation by traditional knowledge but on no other ground it just concludes with a to k and it says there cannot be any further ground than these grounds now the procedure for post grant opposition as we mentioned is different from pre grant opposition in pre grant you had only one rule which determined the entire procedure we saw that rule 55 was the only rule and earlier there was no form for filing a pre grant opposition but after the 2016 amendments to the patent rules they have introduced form 7a so form 7a was introduced recently so now you have a form again pre grant opposition is without fees whereas post grant opposition the procedure is more detailed and you also have payment of fees now 3 tells us about what happens when a post grant opposition is filed 3a where any notice of opposition is duly given under subsection 2 the controller shall notify the patentee so once a notice of opposition is given the controller will communicate that to the patentee there is no room for the exercise of the controller's discretion whereas in pre grant opposition we saw that in rule 55 3 it is mentioned that on consideration of the representation if the controller is of the opinion that the patent shall be refused or complete specification requires amendment he shall give notice to the applicant to that effect so the controller's opinion is important in pre grant opposition he will give notice to the applicant only if the controller forms an opinion that the patent shall be refused or the complete specification requires an amendment exercise of his opinion is not required when it comes to post grant the fact that a post grant opposition is filed the notice goes to the patentee b on receipt of the notice of opposition the controller shall by order in writing constitute a board to be known as the opposition board consisting of such officers as he may determine or refer to such notice of opposition along with the documents to the board of examination and submission of its recommendations to the controller now this is yet another new feature which is not found in pre grant opposition the controller on receipt of notice of opposition has to constitute a board a board comprising of three examiners you will find the details of what the board is now uh, the board comprises of examiners who the constitution of the board and its proceedings are spelt out in detail in rule 56 so we will come to rule 56 soon so this is a significant departure in procedure from what we saw in the pre grant opposition in pre grant opposition there are only three entities who participate in the proceeding one the controller to the applicant or uh, who whose application is in question and three the pre grant opponent now you saw that the grounds of pre grant and post grant are the same so the question that you may ask is that why do we need post grant review because if the grounds are the same and the office before which the grounds are going to be raised that is the patent office continues to be the same what is the need for a post grant opposition because if the patent office has already decided a pre grant and it has come to a decision to grant the patent 
why should the patent office again entertain on the same grounds and probably on the same material another opposition. Now to get over that technical objection probably to get over that technical objection you now have another layer of review which is through the opposition board. So in a normal case there is a controller who issues the statement of first objections there is an examiner who assists the controller and this completes the process. But in post grant there is an entirely new set of examiners three of them who have not seen the application before. So they were not a party to the grant they, they were not a party to prosecuting the application which happened before the grant. There is an entirely new set of people three examiners who constitute the opposition board who come up with an opinion on the granted pattern. So, so this is the distinguishing feature the grounds are not a distinguishing feature there are three examiners who constitute a board who will now come to a conclusion as to whether the grounds raised in the notice of opposition have a case against the pattern. So, this is how by looking at the policy and by looking at the law we can justify the existence of post grant opposition because the grounds are the same the invention is the same, the office is the same. The only thing that is going to be different here is that there is an extra layer of scrutiny by the opposition board. See, every opposition board constituted under clause B shall conduct the examination in accordance with such procedure as may be prescribed and we saw that the procedure, we will soon see that the procedure is what has been prescribed in rule 56. Four, on receipt of the recommendation of the opposition board, so the word recommendation is important because the function of the opposition board is to make a recommendation to the controller. So when we say the opposition board makes a recommendation, the opposition board's recommendation need not be binding on the controller because we understand there is a hierarchy in the patent office, the examiners report to the controller. So the examiners report can at best have a recommendatory effect on the controller it cannot be binding on the controller. So, it is a recommendation just like uh, examiner's report will constitute a recommendation to the controller. Similarly, the opposition board which is nothing but a group of three examiners they would make a recommendation after studying the documents. On receipt of that recommendation of the opposition board and after giving the patentee and the opponent an opportunity of being heard, the controller shall order either to maintain or to amend or to revoke the patent. Now, these are three things that can happen to any patent whenever an objection is raised. The objection could be raised under section 15, the objection could be raised under opposition under 25.1 or an op uh, objection could be raised at the patent office under section 25 2. In all these three cases wherever an objection is raised the patent office can overcome their objection and maintain the patent if the patent is granted. If it is not granted it is in the application state it may, it may grant the patent. So maintain or grant. 2. If something is wrong the patent office can ask the applicant or the patentee to amend. 3. It can revoke the patent or reject the application. So, maintain, amend, revoke would also mean grant, amend or reject the application. If it is in the, if it's in the application stage, we would say that three things can happen. The controller can grant the patent, the controller can amend the patent, the controller can reject the application. When it is a granted patent, we say that the controller can maintain the patent because it is already granted by overcoming the objections. The controller can amend the patent if something is wrong and something can be corrected or the pat uh, controller can revoke the patent. So, on receipt of the recommendation of the opposition board, the controller has to hear the parties, the patentee and the opponent and then the controller has to pass his order. So, this is the procedure of a post grant opposition. A notice of opposition is filed with a statement of opposition and evidences. The patent T has an opportunity to reply to that within a time frame. If the opponent has a rejoinder, if he has a reply to the patentee's reply, he is given time to do that. Then the controller 
fixes a date of hearing, there is a hearing, both the parties are heard and the controller gives an order in writing. Now, before the controller fixes the date of hearing, the controller also makes a reference to the opposition board. He constitutes an opposition board comprising of three examiners and they submit a report what is called the recommendation, submit a recommendation to the controller. So, this is the procedure. 5. While passing an order under subsection 4 in respect of the ground mentioned in clause D or clause E of subsection 2, the controller shall not take into account any personal document or secret trial or secret use. Now, this is with regard to uh, anticipation D mentions if you look at 25 2 D, it refers to one of the grounds of anticipation 25 2 D publicly known or publicly used in India anticipation by prior knowledge or prior use and E is inventive step, lack of inventive step and in those, uh, this provision mentions that in these two cases the controller shall not take into account any personal document or secret trial or secret use. Now, secret trial, secret use, personal document, personal document by which we mean something which is capable of kept as a confidential information. So, anything that is confidential between parties, they are bound by a non-disclosure agreement or something which is not meant for public disclosure like notes kept in a private diary, these things cannot be used for proving anticipation or lack of inventive step. So, this when we come to section 64, we will see the details of what kinds of personal documents are excluded, what is secret trial and secret use and, and we also have some exceptions in anticipation that uh, if you test something or if you experiment something before launching it, then that test if it can only be done in a public space like certain uh, instruments can only be used or, or experimented in the public space, then there is a protection that comes to you by way of a grace period. So, in India we do have grace period, there is a provision for beta testing things and we also now have a judgment which says that beta testing software would not disclose or would not kill the anticipate or would not anticipate the invention. This is the uh, Yahoo case which was decided by the intellectual property appellate board. So, so the controller will exclude any personal document or secret trial or secret use before determining anticipation by prior knowledge or prior use and determining inventive step obviousness or lack of or lack of inventive step. 6. In case the controller issues an order under subsection 4 that the patent shall be maintained subject to amendment, amendment of the specification or any other document, the patent shall stand amended accordingly. Now, whenever the patent is amended, the patent in force becomes the amended patent. So, amendments as we know are of different types. There are various amendments that can happen to the application and all those things are not published because what is published is at the time of grant. But any amendment that happens after the grant needs to be specially published. So, if you look at the official journal, you will also find that amendments carried out after the grant are published. Now, amendments carried out after the grant can come by various means. It could come pursuant to an objection raised under section 55.2 post grant and there is an amendment. But when amendments ha happen after the grant, they need to be separately published. It could also come in a revocation proceeding under section 64, say there is a revocation application filed before the intellectual property appellate board and pursuant to the grounds raised under section 64, the intellectual property appellate board amends the patent or allows an amendment and sustains the patent. Now, again that should be published and when the intellectual property appellate board allows an amendment the patent will be the patent as it stands amended. So, for all practical purposes, for determining infringement, for invalidity analysis, it will be the amended patent that will be the, that will be considered as the patent in force. So, that is what this statement says, the patent shall stand amended accordingly. If the amendment happens before the controller, then it is an in-house affair. It happens within the patent office, which is also the place where the register is kept 
which is also the place where which publishes the amendments through the official journal. So, publishing the amendments done after the grant at the patent office, there is a procedure and it will normally get done. But amendments that happen before the high court in an infringement trial where an invalidity uh, counterclaim of invalidity is raised or the amendments that happen before an IPAB in a revocation proceeding needs to be communicated. So, many a times when a patent is amended by the intellectual property appellate board, you will find a direction to the controller to complete the formalities of the amendment which means publication, correcting the register and other official things which the controller would normally do if the amendment were to happen within the patent office. So, understand amendment after the grant can happen before the patent office for instance under section 252 it can happen in the high court in an infringement suit where the infringer that is the defendant in the patent infringement suit raises a counterclaim to invalidate the patent and pursuant to the counterclaim the court allows the patent but in an amended form or the amendment can happen in a revocation proceeding where the IPAB feels that rather than revoking the patent they would allow an amended version of the claim in the patent to survive. So, amendment could happen in three places post grant. Now, let us look at the corresponding rules. 55A says that the notice of opposition shall be filed in form 7 in duplicate at the appropriate office. Now, appropriate office is the office the patent has been filed. Now, we saw that once a notice of opposition is issued, the controller will constitute an opposition board. Now, the details of constitution of the opposition board are mentioned in 56, rule 56. If you look at rule 56, 56 1 tells us that on receipt of oppos notice of opposition, the controller by order, earlier we saw in writing, which means there has to be a written order. It is an office order, but it is a written order. Constitute an opposition board consisting of three members and nominate one of the members as the chairman of the board. Three members are appointed as members of the board and one person is the chairman. 2. An examiner appointed under subsection 2 of 73 shall be eligible to a member of an opposition board. Now, 73, section 73 generally deals with examiners. It is titled controllers and other officers and in the patent office there are only two officers whom we need to know. One is the controller and the subordinate officers who are called the examiners. Now, 73 2 tells us that for the purpose of this act, the central government may appoint as many examiners and other officers and with such designation as it thinks fit. So, we understand that the members of the opposition board are should be only examiners. 3. The examiner who has dealt with the application for a patent during the proceeding for the grant of a patent thereon shall not be eligible as a member of the opposition board as specified in sub rule 2 of for that application. So, the members of the opposition board should not have been a party or should not have been a part of the examination process before the patent was granted. So, we understand that in every patent before it gets granted there is a report generated by an examiner under section 12 and 13. That report, if an examiner has worked on that report, then he is ineligible, he is disqualified from being in the opposition board. This is just to ensure that a fresh set of people, a fresh set of examiners get to look at the case again. 4. The opposition board shall conduct the examination of the notice of opposition along with the documents filed under rules 50 to six, 57 to 60 referred to under subsection 25 uh, 3 subsection 3 of section 25 submit a report. So, they, they shall conduct an examination submit a report with reasons on each ground taken in the notice of opposition with their joint recommendation within 3 months from the date on which the documents were forwarded to them. So, there is a window period, there is a report and in the report, they shall cover every ground raised and more importantly, it has to be a joint recommendation. So, they cannot be split opinions. 
when it says that join recommendation the rules actually want the opposition vote to speak as one it has to be so so that is what they mean by a joint recommendation we have not seen instances where examiners dissent like how we see dissenting judgments given by judges but in case there is a dissent still the chairman's vote if the chairman takes they, they, we can expect if there are a group of three members we can expect a majority decision two people may give a decision in one way so there could be a majority decision so we have not seen any case uh, to that effect but when when it is mentioned that it's a joint recommendation the understanding is that the opposition board speaks as one even if it, they don't speak as one at least there is a majority opinion so that's a, that's that's how we can justify the odd number of examiners constituting the opposition board so the opposition board will look into the documents filed under rules 57 to 60 which is nothing but statement of opposition with evidences and reply of the patentee and the rejoinder or what uh, the the opponent files on seeing the counter of the patentee all these documents and evidence put together the opposition go board will go through it submit a report on every ground of opposition whether this ground is valid invalid the reasons and give its joint recommendation now this entire process has to be done within three months from the date on which the documents were forwarded to them so we understand that there is a timeline for filing the post grant which is one year after the grant of grant is published then the documents are communicated by the controller to the other side the patentee when the controller constitutes a board the controller also forwards the documents to them from that point they have three months after the they receive the documents to come up with their report now how does the opposition start a post ground opposition with the filing of the notice of opposition rule 57 says that the opponent shall send a written statement in duplicate setting out the nature of the opponent's interest that's important because in the written statement the opponent has to show that he is a person interested so opponent's interest is important opponent's interest is not important or it need not be disclosed in the case of pre-grant that this is tied to the status of a person but since a pre-grant can be filed by any person it does not require demonstration of interest the facts upon which he bases his case and the relief which he seeks and evidence if any along with the notice of opposition and shall deliver to the patentee a copy of the statement and the evidence if any so when the notice of opposition is filed the opponent also files what is called the written statement demonstrating his interest showing the facts on which he bases his case bringing out the relief in most cases it will be to revoke the patent or in some cases it will be to revoke certain claims of an existing patent which he seeks and evidence so these four things have to be spelt out in the written statement and it has to be filed along with the form 7 which is the notice of opposition so what are the four things that the written statement should contain one an opponent's interest demonstrating that he is in person interested the facts this should be a description of facts on which he bases his case he has to claim certain reliefs and he'll have to adduce evidence now once this is communicated to, to the patentee if the patentee desires to contest the opposition now 58 rule 58 tells us what happens after this is done the opponent creates his case files all the documents and serves a copy to the patentee it's easy to serve a copy to the patentee because the patentee's name can be ascertained from the register you could even go to the patent office website look at the details of grant and you will find the name and address of the patentee and the agent so so you could serve to the last known address of the patentee or along with the last known address you could also which you take from the uh, a patent office website you could also serve a copy to the agent's address also as well if the patentee desires to contest an opposition 
he shall leave at the appropriate office a reply statement setting out fully the grounds upon which the opponent is contested and evidence if any in support of his case within a period of two months from the receipt of a copy of the written statement and opponent's evidence if any by him under rule 57 and deliver to the opponent a copy thereof. So, when the patentee receives the statement of opposition, the patentee can create a reply. Now, the reply will set out the grounds on which the opposition is contested along with the evidence. Now, if a ground of uh, lack of inventive step is raised, the reply will try to say that this is not obvious to a person skilled in the art, give reasons for that and if the reply wants to rely on evidence, the evidence will also be there. For instance, the patentee takes a ground that this is not obvious to a person in the art because the prior art was teaching in a different way. So, he will list all the prior art before his invention to show that the current teaching was in a particular way and the invention thought otherwise or the invention they, the word uses teaches away from the prior art. So, so this the patentee will try to demonstrate and in certain other objections the patentee will try to say that the scope of the claim is different and we saw that when we were looking at sections 17 and 18 we saw that the first approach of a patent attorney who is prosecuting an application will be first to convince the controller to his satisfaction that the invention is not anticipated. So, the first approach in prosecution is to convince the controller that there is no anticipation. If the controller is not convinced, then the second thing you would try to do is to amend your application. So, how do you convince a controller that to, uh, to his satisfaction that the invention is not anticipation anticipated? You would tell the controller that this is not the relevant prior art, one way to do it. Secondly, you would say that this could be the relevant prior art, but the claim in the relevant prior art when it is interpreted does not fall within the scope of the claim of your invention. So, you could go on claim interpretation to say that the scope of your claim is different from the scope of the claim in the prior art. So, that is another approach. Third approach could be if the facts allow you to do that to show that your priority by an earlier disclosure either in a foreign country or by using the grace period, you try to show that this prior art does not affect me because I am prior in time. So, there could be multiple approaches, but what you are doing in all these instances is trying to prove to the satisfaction of the controller that you are not hit by this ground. So, similarly, when a patentee responds to a, to a post ground opposition, the patentee tries to prove to the satisfaction of the controller that the evidence based on each ground the opponent has raised does not affect his invention, does not affect the granted patent. For that, he would make a statement to that effect and also adduce evidence. And as I said, depending on how you are going to prosecute the patent, the evidence that you adduce may change. For instance, the objection raised by the opponent is under section 25.2 F. Now, section 25.2 F allows you to take an objection to an invention under section 3 and section 4. So, if it is a pharmaceutical patent, the patent has been granted and it covers a pharmaceutical substance, assume that the opponent raises an objection that the patent as it is claimed in a claim is covered under section 3D. The patentee, if he has not already done that, the patentee can adduce evidence to get over an objection of section 3D and he can give evidence to show that his product or the substance that is covered in his claim has enhanced efficacy compared to the prior art. So, enhancement of efficacy you need to allow evidence if the evidence is not already in place. So, we understand evidence by looking at the kind of objection that came from the opponent. So, the evidence will differ from different grounds and the patentee will have to counter each ground raised with his statement and with his evidence. So, the time period given for this is 2 months from the receipt of 
the written statement from the opponent. So, this the patentee needs to do only if he wishes to contest the opposition. Assume that in a case the patentee after the patent is granted a few years have elapsed though the patentee has been paying the renewal fee and keeping the patent alive. In the light of an objection the patentee feels that there is no need to keep this patent alive. He just receives the notice of opposition and as a business entity the patentee decides not to pursue it. So, a notice of opposition he has received the grounds. So, all the patentee needs to do is not file a reply. If the patentee fails to file a reply then the part post grant opposition will proceed without the involvement of the patentee based on the grounds raised by the opponent and the evidence submitted by him the controller will decide the case even without the patentee. So, there is a provision for that. So, it is not that if what happens if the patentee does not respond because the act the rules very clearly states that if the patentee desires to contest the opposition. So, if the patentee desires not to contest the opposition he will simply not respond to the opposition notice and the documents and the controller will go by the evidence that has been let in. 58.2 tells us that if the patentee does not desire to contest or leave his reply the evidence within the period specified the, pat the patent shall be deemed to have been revoked. Now, deemed to have been revoked is probably used only once in the act and the rules. Uh, we see deemed to have been abandoned, uh, a deemed to have been withdrawn, there are other various deeming provisions. This is the only place where a patent is deemed to be revoked. So, in the sense that there is a challenge to an existing patent and you do not reply to it, the controller will understand that you have given up your patent. So, we had already mentioned the patent system is structured in such a way that any objection that comes to you either from the patent office or from a third party, if you do not respond to it, it is literally a kind of a defense. If you do not defend the objection that comes, there will be various deeming provisions by which you would be assumed that you had given up your right. So, we saw that if you do not pay the fees on time, uh, renewal fees on time then you would have been deemed to have abandoned your uh, your patent. If you do not respond to the objections raised by the patent office it will be deemed to have been abandoned under section 21. If you do not comply with the timeline stipulated by the controller, the controller again deemed that you have abandoned it. If you do not file a request for examination the controller will deem that you have withdrawn. So, all these provision tells us that whenever the ball is hit back to the applicant or the patentee, there is a responsibility on the patentee to hit the ball back to the controller or to the whoever raises that objection. If the applicant or the patentee fails to hit the ball back so to speak, then he loses the game. So, you understand that the patent system is structured in such a way that the burden is always on the person who will benefit from a grant which is the patentee or the applicant. 59 tells us what happens if the patentee files his reply. Now, if the patentee chooses not to contest, it is deemed to be revoked. But he, if he contests, he, he files his reply within 2 months and serves copy on the opponent, then the opponent gets a chance to file a reply to the patentee. That is in 59, we see that the opponent may within 1 month from the date of delivery to him of a copy of the patentee's reply statement and evidence under rule 58, leave at the appropriate office evidence in reply strictly confined to the matters in the patentee's evidence and shall deliver to the patentee a copy of such. Mm -hmm. So, the scope of the reply is only to the matters that the patentee has raised. So, if there is a objection on lack of inventor step which the opponent raised and the only reply on that point by the patentee is that the prior art teaches in a particular way, my invention teaches away from the prior art. Then the scope in your reply is going to be only to that argument that the patentee has raised. You cannot start a new case that is what 59 tells us, you cannot start a new case 
because you can only give a reply strictly confined to matters in the patentee's evidence. So, whatever the patentee has said in his evidence, you have to strictly confine yourself to that. So, once that happens, so let us go through the process again. There is the opponent files his statement and evidence. The patentee in return files his statement and evidence, what we call the reply. The opponent gets one more chance to file his reply to the patentee's statement and evidence. That completes the process. 60 tells us further evidence to be left with the leave of the controller. Once these three steps are over, no further evidence shall be delivered by either party except by the leave or direction of the controller, provided that such leave or direction is prayed before the controller has fixed the hearing under Rule 62. So, once the process of exchanging documents and evidence and statement is over, you cannot bring in new evidence because that the once the controller moves into the hearing mode, it will be very difficult for the controller to appreciate new evidence and new documents coming in because in most cases documents can be technical in nature, it may require time to read and understand them and it may also require some work to be done by the controller and by the opposition board. So, there is a timeline given for adducing evidence. So, once the process of submitting documents is over, no further evidence shall be delivered. The only case where the controller will allow is cases where the permission of the controller is sought for and the permission has to be sought for before the controller starts the hearing. So, it is very simple to understand because once the controller starts hearing the case or fixes a date for hearing, if new documents or new evidence is put in, it becomes difficult for the parties and the controller to read and come up to speed on those documents. So, 61 tells us that copies of the document to be supplied. 1. Copies of all documents referred in the notice of opposition or any statement or evidence filed in connection with the opposition and authenticated to the satisfaction of the controller shall be simultaneously furnished in duplicate unless the controller otherwise directs. So, there is a uh, all, all copies filed have to be in duplicate where a specification or document in a language other than English is referred to in the notice statement or evidence an attested translation thereof in duplicate in English shall be furnished along with such notice if it statement or evidence as the case may be. Now, many a times we find that um, the patent would be objected based on a Chinese patent or a Japanese patent because the, the number of, of patents filed in China are definitely more than what is filed in India. So, you could find a prior art in the form of a Chinese patent. Now, normally if you do a prior art search, the Chinese patent has its abstract in English. The abstract which sometimes is a machine translated abstract is available for search. And if the terms in your claim maps with the terms in the abstract, the abstract will show that these terms or the invention, the concept of an invention covered are covered in the abstract of a Chinese patent. So, in that case, you cannot merely print the machine translation of the abstract and file it as a document in your opposition because under Rule 61, if you are relying on any document in a language other than English, you will have to get it translated first and get it attested and served to the parties and the controller. So, any document in a language other than English needs to be translated and the translation has to be attested. Hearing. Now, when the documentation is completed, the statements filed by all the parties are in place, the evidence is completed, there is no further evidence and any documents which requires translation, the translated copies, the attested translated copies are all in place, the controller will can now fix a hearing of the case. 62.1 tells us on completion of presentation of evidence, if any, 
and on receiving the recommendation of the opposition board or at such time as the controller may think fit, he shall fix a date and time for hearing of the opposition and give the parties 10 days notice and may require the members of the opposition board to be present in the hearing. So, the evidence is complete, the recommendation of the opposition board has come in, the part the controller shall fix a date of hearing and give 10 days notice. And the controller also has the option of asking the members of the opposition board to be present at the hearing. Now, why should he do that? This is optional, he may require just in case there are objections raised during the hearing which can be overcome by an amendment. When an amendment is filed, the controller can still pass the amendment back to the opposition board for further consideration or assume that new grounds of opposition have been raised. The controller can get the benefit of a further recommendation from the opposition board. 62.2. If either party to the proceeding decides to be heard, he shall inform the controller by notice along with a fee as specified in the first schedule. So, the controller issues notice of hearing, the parties will have to indicate if they are attending the hearing. 3. The controller may refuse to hear any party who has not given notice under sub rule 2. So, a party who has not given notice under sub rule 2, which is has not informed the controller and has not paid the fee, the controller may refuse to hear that person. Sub rule 4 says that if either party intends to rely on any publication at the hearing not already mentioned in the notice, statement or evidence, he shall give to the other party and to the controller not less than 5 days notice of his intention together with the details of such publication. Now, we had seen that there is an end to the evidence, but after that point, if a party wants to rely on publication at the hearing, so there is a new document they want to adduce which they had not given before, then that party will have to give the controller and the other party 5 days notice so that they can scrutinize the document and give their reply at that point of hearing. Now, this is where I mentioned that having the opposition board sitting in the hearing may be useful. So, the controller can easily ask the opposition board to come prepared with their views, with their recommendation on the newly introduced document. So, this is on the introduction of new documents. 5. After hearing the party or parties desirous of being heard or if neither party desires to be heard, then without a hearing and after taking into consideration the recommendation of the opposition board the controller shall decide the opposition and notify his decision to the parties giving reasons thereof. So, once an opposition is filed, whether the parties come for the hearing or not, the controller shall consider the recommendation of the opposition board and he shall give a decision which has to be in writing and the decision has to be communicated to all the parties. Rule 63, if the patentee notifies the controller that he desires to withdraw the patent after notice of opposition is given, the controller depending on the merits of the case may decide whether cost should be awarded to the opponent. Now, cost is something that is awarded to the succeeding party in a legal proceeding. If there is a legal proceeding between two parties, party A and B, party A files the case against party B and party A succeeds he gets the relief that he wants against party B. Party A can, because he is the succeeding party who succeeds, party A can ask for legal costs, the cost of conducting the legal proceedings. So, in post grant opposition, the opponent is entitled to costs if the patentee withdraws the patent after the notice of opposition is given. So, this is a clear provision that if the patentee withdraws his patent after the notice is given, then the controller has the power to decide whether the cost should be awarded to the opponent. It is not an automatic process. The controller will still look at the merits of the case and see whether costs have to be awarded. Now, compare this with the earlier provision where the patentee chooses not to contest the case. 
we saw that patentee has an opportunity to file his reply. If the patentee does not file his reply under rule 58.2, the patent shall be deemed to have been revoked. But if he withdraws his application, in that case he is not withdrawing his patent. He is only not filing a reply to the opposition. If he fails to file a reply to the opposition, it is deemed as though he has it is deemed that the patent is revoked. But under 63, if the patentee withdraws the patent, that is a conscious act, he is withdrawing the patent after the notice of opposition is given and there is no procedure for withdrawing the patent, there is no procedure. So, withdraw the patent, there is, there is a procedure for withdrawing an application and there is a procedure for surrendering a patent, there is as such the word withdraw a patent, there is no procedure for this. But assume that he withdraws it or he makes it clear that he wants to withdraw the patent and we can understand that withdraw after grant could be surrender. That is one way to understand it because there is no procedure of withdrawing a patent, there is only a procedure to surrender the patent or there is a procedure to abandon the patent which is by not paying the renewal fees. So, we understand withdraw as a conscious act. Non-payment of renewal fee is not a conscious act, you are just letting something go away, a deadline to go away. So, if you withdraw it, we understand withdraw as a surrender. So, if a question is asked, how do you surrender a patent or what is meant by withdrawal of a patent under rule 63 and if the choice has surrender of patent, then that would be the appropriate answer because there is no other procedure by which you can withdraw the patent.